So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly breeze through two topics. One is about the use of ultrasound imaging and guidance for neuroma ablation, and the other one is the potential role when it comes to spinal cord stimulation. I had no financial conflicts of interest. And uh, quickly going over the neuroma. Neuroma is, neuromas typically appear hypoechoic, as you can see here. You can view them in the longitudinal view or the transverse view. Transverse view is much quicker. And then you definitely want to trace it all the way into the nerve of origin. This is a terminal neuroma. In a, uh, there are other places where you can get neuromas. And you also want to remember that not all of them are as big as the first one that I showed you. Some of them are really, really tiny. The key is to trace it from the nerve of origin. And this is another picture of a neuroma. Moving on. So the, when it comes to the diagnosis of neuroma, it seems pretty clear. Now, the, when it comes to the options for treatment, there are different opinions and different ways in which people would handle it. This is a demonstration of how you could do a... Sorry, go back. This is a demonstration of how you could do a intraneuronal or intraneuroma steroid injection. Some people can claim benefit to it. I have done it, but it doesn't last that long. The other option you have is to inject some type of uh, neurolytic agent, or you could actually do a radiofrequency ablation of the nerve. So the way to do that is, first, you definitely want to do a test injection with local anesthetic in order to ensure that the origin of pain is actually the neuroma. Once you have made the diagnosis, the next step is to do a radiofrequency ablation. Prior to doing the radiofrequency ablation, you always want to block the nerve proximal to the neuroma so that introduction of the needle into the neuroma doesn't cause too much pain. So the way, way I typically do it is, once I have anesthetized the nerve, I put my needle right into the neuroma and then do a thermal lesion, especially in patients with stump neuromas where there is really no purpose to the nerve beyond that area, beyond the stump. So it usually works for a much longer time when you do a stump neuroma. We're talking in terms of years. And um, I must thank my friends from Hong Kong for this picture. This is another interesting um, image that we were able to acquire in Hong Kong. So it was, it was somebody for whom we scanned the neck, and there was this large blob-like thing. So we really didn't know where it was coming from. So when we started looking at it from the origin of different roots, we located that it was actually coming from the C5 nerve root and becoming a big blob. This is a patient who had a brachial plexopathy following a motor vehicle accident about 30 years prior. That's, that's one other option for you in terms of diagnosing a neuroma. Uh, when it comes to spinal cord stimulator implant, there is some controversy. I'm really not sure. So what I first did was I put the spinal cord stimulator implants underwater, scanned them to see how they would appear underwater, and then I went on to scan in a real patient. I always want to program the, program the implant or check the implant with the programmer prior to as well as after just to ensure that it is safe when it comes to using spinal cord stimulator. Why would I use it? My initial reason was just curiosity. I just wanted to see how it looks. The second one is, if you have a collection here, it'll be very easy to pick it up if you want to aspirate. Yes, sure. Seromas can occur, as you all know, anywhere in the body. When you scan further laterally, close to where you have the insertion of your contact leads, this is, this is going to be the typical appearance. This is a normal patient. So you could use this as a reference. And these are the underwater dummy implants. Now, if, if I were to scan further beyond the um, IPG, this is how it's going to look. You will, you will have hyperechoic lines running all the way from the generator to your epidural contact, epidural space. But one of the downsides is that, which you're going to see later on, is that you can see in both longitudinal and um, transverse views as long as the leads are superficial. The moment they go beyond, as they dip in, the resolution drops significantly. And especially when it comes to, when it comes to using a um, curved transducer, which has got a low frequency, 
you realize that it is very difficult to pick up. Or I can guess maybe this is the lead, but I'm not sure. So maybe its utility is limited to less than three, four centimeters. That's, only the, uh, that's one downside. The other thing that I want to mention is the advantages are maybe just to detect proper placement, especially if you're, if you're working with somebody who is very thin, you don't want to be very superficial, neither do you want to be very deep. So this may help in terms of directing the leads to wherever your target is. The other one is obviously looking for collections. Another interesting thing that I did also was I tried to, to me at least it was interesting, I tried to remove the leads underwater and see if I could detect any change in the moment. Unfortunately, we cannot. So this is not something which will tell you whether it will actually, which, whether the leads are disconnected from the IPG. So ultimately, it may be novel, but it has to have a clinical utility. And that, I think, is a take-home message for me as well as most other investigators. Thank you.